Welcome to part 4 of our series, where we're talking about creating your first robot with ROS and Ubuntu Core. In part 3, we got data out of the wireless controller and into ROS in a format meant for controlling a differential drive robot like ours. Today we're going to create a ROS node that takes the data from the wireless controller and turns it into wheel speeds to drive our robot. By the way, remember that this is also a blog series, the link is in the description. Now, there are a number of ways we can tackle the problem of turning controller input into wheel speeds. There are actually ROS projects that already exist for exactly this purpose, but we don't have the sensors necessary to use any of them. Explaining why that is will make this video longer than I'd like, but there's an in-depth discussion on the corresponding blog post that you should read. Long story short, if we had wheel speed sensors, we could use what's called a closed loop controller, but we don't. So today we're going to write what's called an open loop controller. Let's get on with it, shall we? There's really only one new prerequisite here, a little more Python knowledge. We've kept it as simple as we could until now, but it's time for our code to grow up a little. You're already familiar with functions at this point, and today we're going to use classes. A link to a good tutorial is in the description if you need it. Thanks to part 3, we have the controller generating twist messages, which represent the desired linear and angular velocity of the robot. At the end of the day, the only way the robot moves at all is by changing wheel direction and speed. We need to develop a way to convert the commanded velocities into wheel speeds that actually accomplish what was commanded. To do that, we need a smidge of math. The simplest part of this is linear velocity, so let's start with that. If we command the robot to move forward at 1 meter per second, in what direction and at what speed does each wheel need to move? The answer should be intuitive. Both wheels need to spin forward at 1 meter per second. Great, that gives us our formula for the linear part of the wheel velocity. So, let's talk about angular velocity. It's a little more tricky, but not too much. If we command the robot to turn left at 90 degrees per second, in what direction would each wheel need to turn? The answer is still intuitive, but it depends on how we want to make our robot turn. There are two options here, single wheel turning and double wheel turning. Single wheel turning involves leaving one wheel stationary and turning the other. Double wheel turning involves rotating both wheels in opposite directions, thus sharing the work of the turn. If we opted for single wheel turning, the answer to the question would be the left wheel doesn't turn at all, the right wheel turns forward. However, I prefer the double wheel method, so my answer is the left wheel turns backward and the right wheel turns forward. That gives us the proper wheel direction, so now let's talk about speed. If we command the robot to turn left at 90 degrees per second, at what speed would each wheel need to turn? This turn causes the wheels to trace the circumference of a circle. Remember that formula? 2 times pi times the radius of that circle. Now how big of a portion of that circle are we wanting to turn? Well, we know that 360 degrees is an entire circle, so we can use a ratio and combine it with the circumference to create our formula for wheel speed, which ends up really just being the formula for the length of an arc. We're making great progress here, but there's still an unknown in this formula, the radius. What is it? It's half the distance between the two wheels, a measurement that we call the track. Let's account for that in our formula. Very nice. Using this sweet new formula, we can answer the question. I measured my robot's track to be 0 0.091 meters. Using that, I calculate that the left wheel should be turning backwards at 0 0.071 meters per second, and the right wheel should be moving forward at the same speed. As it turns out, we can actually simplify this formula. Why? Because the twist message specifies angular velocities in terms of radians per second, not degrees. 360 degrees is 2 pi radians. If we change our ratio to use radians, things start canceling beautifully. Alright, it's time to combine the linear and angular components of our formula and determine a formula for both the left and right wheels. To do that, we take into account that the Ross conventions follow the right-hand rule, which means that a positive angular velocity means a counterclockwise turn and a negative angular velocity means a clockwise turn. Let's decide right now that a positive value means that our wheels turn forward and a negative value turns them backward. Using these two facts, along with the formulas we just discussed, we can come up with formulas for both wheels. <sighs> okay, we got most of the math out of the way, but we have something else we need to sort out. Our wheel speeds are in meters per second, but as you learned in CamJam worksheet number 7, the way we actually control the motors is by applying a duty cycle between 0 and 100. Well, how do we get from meters per second to duty cycles? 
As I mentioned earlier, if we had wheel speed sensors, we could compare how fast the robot was going to how fast it should be going and say, hey, the duty cycle needs to be higher or needs to be lower. However, we discussed that this needs to be an open loop controller. We need to get our duty cycle by making some assumptions instead of using feedback data. We'll do this by determining a robot's maximum possible speed and obtain the duty cycle by dividing the requested speed by the maximum speed. So how do we determine our robot's maximum speed? The most accurate way would be to actually measure it, essentially measure out a meter, set the vehicle at the beginning, get out your stopwatch, and do a drag race. However, to keep things simple, we can cheat. If you notice from part 3, by default the data from the controller has a maximum value of 0.5. That means if we see a 0.5, we know that the controller is maxed out. So if we just pretend that our robot's maximum speed is 0.5 meters per second, maxing out the controller will also max out our robot's speed. It's dirty, but it works for our case since we're only using a controller anyway. Okay, let's turn this into code. We're about to rewrite the driver node we started in part 2 to handle twist messages instead of string messages. This requires opening up the EduKit bot package's package.xml and changing the standard messages dependency to geometry messages. Now, why don't we clean this up a little while we're at it? This is saying, in order to build, I require Katkin and RossPy. In order to run, I require Python rpy.gpio, RossPy, and geometry messages. Now that we finally have that math out of the way, let's write the Ross driver that utilizes it. As I mentioned, we'll be rewriting the driver node in the EduKit bot package that we started in part 2. Make sure that workspace is activated. Now, open up the driver node in your favorite editor. First of all, instead of the string message, we'll need to import the twist message. We'll also save the frequency into a more conventionally named variable called underscore frequency. The underscore indicates that it's for internal use only, and all caps indicates that it's a constant. Now we're going to write a function called underscore clip. It's pretty simple. It makes sure that a given value is between the given minimum and maximum. We'll use it in a minute to make sure we don't try to make the motors move with a duty cycle less than zero or greater than 100. Now we're going to create a new class to represent a motor that we can move. This is the initializer for the motor class. It's called automatically whenever a new instance is created. It accepts two parameters, one for each pin involved in moving the motor, one forward, one backward. It then sets the pins up as outputs and saves off the PWMs for use in the method we're about to write. This move method is the workhorse of the motor class. It's how the motor moves. It accepts a positive or negative percent between 0 and 100 where a positive value moves forward and a negative value moves backward. Here's where we utilize that clip function we wrote to ensure the percentage requested does not fall outside the valid range of a duty cycle. Let's write one more class called driver which represents the ROS driver itself. Here's its initializer called automatically when a new instance is created. It doesn't accept any parameters since it supports changing its behavior by way of parameters from the ROS parameter server you learned about in the ROS tutorials. It starts out by initializing the ROS node which begins communication with the ROS master. It then records the current time, which we'll use in a minute, and retrieves the values for all the parameters it supports. Then it creates two instances of the motor class we just wrote to represent the left and right motors and initializes their speeds to zero. Now, as a quick aside, it's important that I point out that these pins correspond to which motor is motor A, which is motor B, and the polarity used to hook them up. If you happen to connect yours differently than I connected mine, that's fine, but you may need to switch these pins around a little or your robot will move hilariously badly. Anyway, finally, it subscribes to our twist topic, which is called command vel. That's a ROS convention, it means commanded velocity. We hook that topic up to the underscore velocity received callback method so it's called whenever a new command is received. Let's write that method now. Here's where the math we did in steps 1 and 2 come into play. First of all, we need to record the time we received the message. We'll come back to that in a minute. Then, we extract the linear and angular velocity components out of the message we received. Using this information, we use the wheel speed formula we derived in step 1 to calculate the left and right wheel speeds in meters per second. Then we use the duty cycle formula derived in step 2 to turn those wheel speeds into left and right percentages. Since these values can be negative, they represent both the desired duty cycle as well as wheel direction. Importantly, note that this function doesn't actually change the wheel speeds, it just calculates what they should be. Why? Well, let me explain that by writing the run method. This is the control loop of our driver class. It's where we actually apply the newly calculated wheel speeds in a loop that runs at a specific rate, which is 10 Hz by default. What if we don't receive a new commanded velocity by the time we loop again? Well, we just use the old one, which seems a little odd, but why do we have a loop at all if we only ever use the commanded velocity? 
Well, let's say we pulled this logic out of the loop and put it in the message handler, the velocity received callback method. That's something I see people do a lot. What happens if we receive a few commanded velocities, but then the network went down or we otherwise lost communication with the controller? The robot would just continue moving at the previously commanded velocity and you would have to go chase it down. I've had that happen on a robot that weighed several hundred pounds. It went out of range of the control unit and just kept on trucking. My legs were sore for a week. This design defends against that potential problem. We put this logic in its own loop and record when commanded velocities come in, such that we can implement a timeout to make sure that our robot never runs away from us if issues do occur. We simply calculate how long it's been since we last received a commanded velocity. If it's less than the timeout, which is 2 seconds by default, then we use that commanded velocity. If it's greater than the timeout, we halt the robot. Okay, let's write the main part of our program where we simply create a new instance of the driver class, start its control loop, and when the control loop exits, we clean up GPIO. This is the entry point of the whole node. We simply run the main method. Alright, we're done here. Let's build our package and move on. Let's test this thing, shall we? As in part two, we need to make sure we have permission to access GPIO as a user. Remember that this resets upon reboot. We're also going to use what we learned in part three to get the controller giving us twist messages. Open up four terminals, each running the classic shell with our workspace activated. In one terminal, run the master. In the second, run the join node. In the third, we'll run the teleop node from part three, but with a small change. Remember back in step two how we used the fact that the messages from the controller maxed out at 0.5? That works great for linear velocities, but it also means the controller maxes out at 0.5 radians per second for its angular velocity, which is so slow the motors can't actually pull it off. They just give off a quiet buzzing sound instead. The solution is to require the teleop node to scale those values to more reasonable turning speeds by specifying an angular scaling factor. Experiment with this to see how twitchy you like your robot, larger values will make it more sensitive. I settled on a value of 4. Alright, now in the fourth terminal, run our new driver node. And now you can successfully drive it around. That is it for part 4. In part 5, we'll finish up our series by introducing launch files and turning our ROS package into a snap that starts on boot and is easily installed by your friends. See you then.